good evening everybody it's 8 o'clock and time to start our uh, episode on uh, implications of uh, obesity on uh, pediatric perioperative care uh, i'm uh, happy to welcome dr subhashini subramaniam uh, dr subhashini is a pediatric cardiologist and obesity medicine specialist at uh, new jersey she is the founder of the children center for holistic heart health and medical director of healthy eating and lifestyle program she is a faculty member at the hackensack meridian health school of medicine at uh, seton hall university she did her mbbs from uh, jipma pondicherry and her uh, pediatric residency from suny upstate medical center at syracuse after that she did her fellowship in pediatric cardiology at the university of rochester medical center she is also board certified in obesity medicine and is uh, very uh, concerned and passionate about the growing epidemic of uh, pediatric obesity in fact she was the one who suggested that uh, we should do something on this topic and uh, she has been a uh, you know great supporter of our marvelous medicine uh, uh, series so thank you very much subhashini for your uh, interest and in helping us out uh, devnath is not new to uh, the marvelous medicine program uh, those of you who attended would have heard the wonderful lecture on uh, fetal interventions which kept everyone glued to their uh, phones and laptop uh, devnath despite his busy schedule has been kind enough to join us again for those of you who didn't hear about him devnath chatterjee he is a pediatric anesthesiologist he, associate professor of anesthesiology at the university of colorado school of medicine he is also the program director for the pediatric anesthesiology fellowship at the university of colorado he did his mbbs from uh, jipma pondicherry and his anesthesia residency in syracuse new york after that he did his pediatric anesthesia fellowship at boston children's hospital he is very passionate about medical education and using innovative teaching methodologies and for that he regularly records video podcasts on four pediatric anesthesia topics the the very fact that despite a busy schedule uh, he is willing to join us regularly in our marvelous medicine program shows his keen passion to teach using uh, you know non formal uh, methodologies he is the education uh, editor of the journal of pediatric anesthesia and he is also a section editor of open anesthesia he was recently nominated as the chair elect of the american academy of pediatric section on anesthesiology his areas of clinical interest include anesthesia for fetal intervention which i already mentioned earlier and he is the director of fetal anesthesia at the colorado fetal care center one of the busiest fetal care centers in the us he is also the prin principal investigator of a study on ba pediatric bariatric surgery called teen labs welcome again uh, deb and thank you for uh, sparing your time i was really uh, touched and uh, uh, very grateful when dr shripati uh, renowned pediatric urologist of chennai accepted my invitation to join uh, we are neither a academic forum nor am i a big wig but just one message because we worked together many many years ago in the same hospital just one whatsapp message and he accepted my invitation i thank you very much dr shripati i am uh, really grateful dr shripati is a senior consultant pediatric urologist and robotic surgeon at uh, apollo children's hospital in chennai he did his mbbs and ms from stanley medical college he did his pediatric anesthesia pediatric surgery training at cmc velour and after that he spent a few years in australia where he developed his interest in pediatric urology and uh, almost for 25 years now he's been uh, focusing only on pediatric urology he is a director of pediatric urology fellowship at uh, apollo hospital and he is also the adjunct professor uh, in mgr medical university uh, thank you once again uh, dr shripati would you like to say a few words before subhashini starts because when i spoke to some of the pediatric surgeons and even pediatric cardiologists they seem to think uh, obesity to pediatric obesity uh, i don't think it's too much of a problem in india but ever since i worked with you in 1993 in child trust i know that you know we see enough of uh, uh, obese children who give us a lot of problem and i went through some literature and uh, uh, there are a lot of studies on poorer outcomes in pediatric urology uh, in children who are obese and uh, contrary to what we think that all uh, congenital heart disease children are uh, sick and thin and uh, Twenty-five uh, percent of uh, cardiac patients in pediatric uh, age are also obese. So, Absolutely. would you like to just set the ball rolling by Absolutely. giving us an overview? Yes. 
yes uh, i i think you uh, i think it's a lovely topic that you have chosen today and you have to uh, uh, very eminent marvelous speakers just reading subhashini's and devnath's uh, seen uh, put me back several years and i felt you know i have the same 24 hours but i'm not able to accomplish what they have done and that's that's fantastic i mean the number of hats that they uh, uh, that they you know wear and uh, the marvelous things that they do is really uh, i think it should be a a great uh, example for a lot of people now obesity is something that's being underestimated in children i completely agree with you in uh, the practice uh, in apollo at least 7 to 10 children every week i have a i have an outpatient clinic of uh, approximately about 14 to 15 every day 6 days a week and i find that at least 10 children i have to refer to the dietitian for dietary advice especially since the covid pandemic came upon us and people seem to think that being fat is cute and i keep telling them the various problems of obesity and then only then they realize that it's not such a great idea so i think the era of obesity and its related problems like you know the non communicable diseases is really upon us we are going to see an avalanche of it in the la- in the next uh, in the next uh, 10 to uh, 10 to 20 years uh, hopefully i would have retired by then uh, so if we really look forward to listening to uh, both of you and i'm very happy to note that this is being streamed on facebook and uh, what i will do is i will ask all my uh, you know the parents of all the children who are fat and the parents who don't seem to care about this to look at this to understand what are the implications and how to go about taking this seriously thank you very much for asking me to uh, to moderate the session and welcome both of you it will be an honor to listen to both of you thank you thank you dr uh, vidya and dr uh, shripati and and uh, thank you for uh, marvelous medicine for giving me the opportunity to uh, speak to this audience today uh, the reason i'm very passionate about this topic is that i personally have a lifelong struggle with my weight i was uh, an overweight child i was an overweight adolescent and i have been uh, overweight most of my most of my adult life so uh, when people ask me as a pediatric cardiologist you know there are far more interesting topics because i i take care of complex congenital heart disease i take care of i do fetal echoes why are you doing this the reason it clicked for me is that you know we were getting a lot of obese children referred to us and there was not a whole lot we could offer them we would do an ekg we would do an echocardiogram and then send them back to the pediatrician to you know for further care so i the reason that prompted me to go train further in this specialty is that you know you know it, it is frustrating not to be able to help these children so i'm going to share uh, my screen there uh, i hope everybody can see my screen yeah okay. come it's come up And yes just, uh, oh. you have a slide show uh, yeah absolutely absolutely perfect okay great so uh the pediatric obesity as dr shripati said is really an epidemic we underestimate the gravity of the situation uh especially i think in india where you know like he said it it fat children are considered cute fatness is associated with being prosperous you know we you know at least when back in the 90s when we trained we used to have mothers coming and saying my child is too thin what can i give them to you know have them gain weight but then that that is no longer true so what we're going to do in the talk today is first of all look at the scope of the problem how how big the problem is we're going to look at factors that are associated with childhood obesity and we are going to define what pediatric obesity means it is very similar to adult classification but it's different in some ways we are also going to look at various comorbid factors which affect you know the perioperative uh, uh morbidity in these children and we are going to very briefly look at the uh, management of childhood obesity so looking at the epidemiology So the prevalence of obesity in children has been steadily increasing. So it was about 5% in the 1980s. Uh in the 1960s, then it jumped up in the 1980s and it's now tripled. It's about 18.5% of all children in 2016. And out of uh, adolescents who are aged 12 to 19, one out of five children, that's 20% of all children are obese. And uh so and out of these about 8.5% are severely obese so what we call class 2 and 3 obesity and in in sheer numbers that this amounts to about 4.6 million children who are severely obese 
so when I when I see kids in the office, about four, over forty percent of kids are either overweight or obese. If I see ten patients a day, chances are four to five of them uh, are are either overweight or obese. And and we also see a higher prevalence in certain racial and ethnic groups, uh, especially you know mainly because of genetic causes, but also because uh, of uh, socioeconomic status, because these communities tend to live in poorer areas and have a less access to healthy food and exercise. And over time, we have also been seeing an increase in the proportion of patients with severe or what is called morbid obesity. We try to avoid the word morbid because it's, it's got a negative connotation, but uh, severe obesity is on the rise. And uh, obese children, become obese adults. So if, if uh, so and, and so the best time to intervene is nip it in the bud and take care of it as early as we can. So this is a graph that shows the growth in childhood obesity over uh, since the 1990s. As you can see, the overall rate of obesity and overweight has kind of remained steady since the early 2000s. But look at the class two and class three. So these are, having a meteoric rise. There's a geometric increase. There's like exponential increase in the class two and class three obesity in children. The risk of obesity extends across the lifespan. So it, it starts even before a child is conceived because of uh, what is called epigenetic factors. And then it continues in the perinatal period and the neonatal period. And then of course, we all know about all the factors that affect uh, our, our weight when we are children and adults. So looking at the role of epigenetics. So epigenome are, is, is refers to heritable alterations in gene expression, which do not actually alter the DNA sequence, but can turn off or turn on certain genes. So the intrauterine environment is really important and the prepartum maternal weight is, is a big factor. So both mothers who, who are underweight and overweight can, uh, can have children, can uh, have children who, who are obese. So one of the best ways that, that this was studied was during the Second World War the, in, in what was called the Dutch famine. So the, because of the German occupation in, in the Netherlands, they were rationing food. So everybody, including pregnant women, were only allotted about 400 to 800 calories per day. So even though these babies were born undernourished, when these were followed over time, these babies turned out to be obese adults. And they turned out to have multiple cardiovascular issues, which, which can be attributed to epigenetic changes in the womb. So added to this are maternal complications like gestational diabetes and uh, preeclampsia. So the, 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 the thought is that, that there are changes in the nutrient uh, availability in, the, in, in utero so these, th this leads to epigenetic alterations in the fetal genome. Uh, I have an interesting uh, case to a uh, patient to share. So I was doing a fetal echo on a pregnant woman who herself had had bariatric sur surgery. She had had a gastric bypass. She had severe malnutrition because uh, she had dumping syndrome. She had malabsorption. And during pregnancy, she actually had to go on parental nutrition and had to get iron infusions for uh, severe uh, iron deficiency anemia. So the reason I, I was involved was that uh, they noted that, the, that there was polyhydramnios and uh, they noted that there was cardiomegaly in the baby. So I saw the baby, yes, the baby had cardiomegaly. Uh, we, we said, okay, we will see the baby after birth. And turns out the baby tested positive for beckwith vitamin syndrome. So uh, it, is, it is well known that yes, beckwith vitamin is, is a sporadic syndrome, but 15% can be familial, but there are multiple epigenetic factors that we don't know about. And beckwith vitamin is one of those syndromes which is associated with very early onset and very severe uh, obesity. So children, and there are also interesting studies on children born to women before and after pedi uh, uh, bariatric surgery. So, uh, the risk actually, risk of the child turning out to be obese actually goes down if, if the woman is counseled and they lose weight between pregnancies. And the peri as far as perinatal factors, we are, we are well aware of fetal like, issues like fetal macrosomia due to uh, maternal diabetes. This is associated with uh, obesity in childhood and later life. 
and also leads to other perinatal issues like shoulder dystocia, uh, increased incidence of C-section and uh, transient kidney, et cetera. But on the, on the flip side, extremely low birth weight infants or premature infants are also at higher risk for becoming obese adolescents and adults. This is attributed to something called the thrifty metabolism because in the womb, when they're deprived of nutrition, then their, their bodies, their epigenetics dictates that they conserve those nutrients, those macronutrients when they turn into adolescents and adults. So these kids, the premature kids, uh, have been shown to have increased visceral fat and increased insulin resistance in adolescents. So childhood and beyond, these are factors that you know, all of us are pretty well aware of. Uh, there, there is a lot of uh, 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 you know, impact uh, 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 from family beliefs and habits regarding a child's diet, uh, whether somebody breastfeeds or doesn't best breastfeed, whether uh, when a child is weaned to solid foods and what kind of foods we eat. Uh, there are certain communities, especially Hispanic communities, Indian communities, where every single event in the family is around food. If, if somebody is born, the celebration has food. If somebody dies, it's, it's food. And it's, it's some communities, it's considered uh, rude to refuse food. You walk into an Indian family, they offer you food. It's considered rude to refuse it. Similarly, uh, I, I also, you know, it's also, I, I'm, I'm a little guilty of this myself. We teach our children from an early age, clean your plate. Don't leave anything on your plate. You know, I'm, I, you know, I used to yell at my daughter in the past, you know, whenever she left food on the plate, I would say, uh, uh, do you know there are starving children in Africa? And, uh, you know, you're wasting food. You're literally throwing money down the trash can. But by doing that to children and, you know, imprinting that you have to finish what's on your plate, we, we, have, we kind of force them to ignore their fullness signals. So now I tell my daughter, if, she, if she's full, stop eating. Because those signals get blunted when we are conditioned into thinking that we need to finish what's on our plate. Second thing is the activity level. As we all know, we, we are sitting most of the day. If you're in a sedentary uh, occupation or children in school are doing remote schooling, they're sitting most of the day. And, and you know, gym class is virtual. So the teacher has no idea whether, whether the, the child is doing phys ed or not. And two of the biggest things that are, are directly associated with childhood obesity are screen time and sugar sweetened beverages. So the amount of screen time, especially in this era of remote learning is, is, is horrendous. So this is directly related to weight gain in children. And this starts very early. You know, the, the TV is a great babysitter. So you sit a child, a toddler or a child in front of the TV, you don't have to watch them. They're like zombies. So, you know, the amount of screen time that kids get, you know, I think back to my childhood, we used to have two, two hours of do that program, right? Now we have round the clock. We have, we have child pro kids programming round the clock, multiple channels, right? And they can watch TV anytime they want. Plus they have iPads, they have devices, they have their phones. So they're always in front of some kind of screen. Number two is the consumption of sugar sweetened beverages like juice, like uh, soda, like Coca-Cola, like Pepsi. So when I first moved to America, you know, you know when I would walk in to uh, get some food at a takeout, they would always ask you when you check out, oh, what are you have, going to have to drink with that? So people are conditioned into thinking they need to have a soft drink with their food, right? The, and there is a lot of direct marketing to kids from big you know, companies like Pepsi and Co to, to get them to start this habit from a very early age. The other thing that I always ask parents about is how much juice does your child drink? Because people think that juice is healthy, okay? So uh, other things like the socioeconomic status I mentioned, you know, the, the, some communities where they live, they don't have access to supermarkets which sell healthy food. So their, their best bet is to go to McDonald's or uh, you know, uh, the nearest uh, Taco Bell and get a 99 cent meal. It's cheap, it's available, and that's all you know, they can afford. Also, there, you know, there are certain areas and cities where it's not safe 
for children to play outside. There are no safe playgrounds. So all of these factors affect uh, uh, weight gain during childhood. Now let's, let's get to definitions. We've been talking about you know, severity of obesity. So as we all know, BMI is, is the criteria that we use to define, uh, the, to define and classify obesity. It's the weight in kilograms divided by the square of the height in meters. The normal BMI in children is considered to be between the fifth and the 85th percentile. So below that, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, low, low weight and above the 85th percent is abnormal. And we also, in, in older adolescents, we, we tend to use absolute BMI values just like in adults. So in, in kids who are under two years of age, we use the WHO uh, weight for recumbent length flow charts. In, in children over two years, we, we use the CDC flow charts. So as you can see, the healthy weight is in green. It is between the fifth and the 85th percentile. We used to have this kind of gray area here. It used to be called at risk for overweight, but that was too ambiguous. So now this has been changed. The 85th to the 95th percent has been changed to overweight, just overweight. So anything above the 95th percentile is considered obese. So we, because of the increase in severity of, of pediatric obesity, we further classify it. So anybody above the 95th percentile is, is obese. So now we multiply, let's take the, way, the BMI at the 90th percentile and we multiply that by 1.2. So if the child is between, is greater than the 95th, but less than 120% of the 95th. So easiest way to do it is to take the, the cutoff for the 95th and then multiply by 1.2. So if they're between this, it's considered class one. Anything between 120 to less than 140% of the 95th percentile is considered class two. And over 140% of the 95th percentile is considered class three. But when we classify this, we also take into account oops, the, the absolute BMI. So we, we look at the absolute BMI and we look at this, we, we consider whichever is lower so that we don't, you know, we know, we don't misclassify or we don't miss children who are actually obese. So when we assess these children, you know, wh what we do in, in my practice is that a week or two before the appointment, we send out ex extensive questionnaires, including a food journal an activity log and a detailed family history. So like anybody else, we would, we would ask for family history of obesity, type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancers in both first and second degree relatives. We ask for history of uh, weight gain and loss. You know, many, many patients, especially the older ones, they've tried different things. They've tried fad diets. They've tried Weight Watchers. Some of them have taken over-the-counter supplements. So we ask about their, their weight gain and weight loss and what happened when, when they lost weight. So, and one, one other important factor is the age at which the child crossed the 85th or the, and the 95th percentiles because it helps to know what was going on at the time, because obesity is a lot more than just what you, know, what you eat versus, and what, what you expend, because there are other factors like social factors. Did, were the, did the parents get divorced? Was there some other stressor in the child's life? Did they you know, go to middle school or high school? So when did that happen? Because it matters. So at the age at which the parents noticed or got concerned, so like Dr. Sripati said, parents, you know, when, when your child is chubby, you think that they are healthy. You don't, you don't want to do anything about parents more often care when their children are, are underweight. So it is, it's very interesting to ask the parents when they noticed or got concerned and why they got concerned. We also ask about medication history, the number of children who are on um, ADHD medications or medications for oppositional defiant disorder. Uh, antipsychotics, antidepressants, anti-seizure medicine. These are all causes of iatrogenic weight gain. And it can be treated, it can, the, the medications can be you know, changed. So we work very closely with the pediatrician and the psychiatrist to kind of uh, figure out what's the best for the child. And we look at the, we ask about the growth and development because we wanna rule out syndromic causes of uh, obesity. Uh, sleep is, is a biggie. We all know that adolescents don't get enough sleep. They go to bed at two o'clock, they wake up at noon. Uh, our, our body follows a circadian rhythm. 
there's a reason we sleep at a certain time and wake up at a certain time because all our, our growth hormone spikes or cortisol spikes when we sleep. So it is very important to ask about the sleep history and the ideal amount of sleep for to maintain an ideal body weight is somewhere around seven to eight hours, okay? And we also asked about snoring. So we have an extensive questionnaire about snoring, about uh, daytime fatigue, about school performance, about uh, ADHD-like symptoms in school, because these can all be uh, indicators for sleep apnea. So, uh, and, and some, some kids will, will have nocturnal enuresis. They, they would have been continent for a while and then start having um, nocturnal enuresis because of sleep apnea. And then one of the most important things is we, we assess the attitude and the willingness of the family to make changes. This is a family-based affair. There is no point if one person in the family is on board and the rest are like bringing junk food home. So we assess the entire family's attitude and the willingness to make changes. Then, then comes the behavioral assessment. As we talked about, the, the screen time is extremely important. I mean, now. So the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends zero screen time for kids under two. I don't know if that ever happens in any household. Okay, so no screen time under two years of age. Kids over two years of age uh, should have two hours or less of screen time per day, which, which all goes out of the window because we are in the middle of remote schooling. So everybody is in front of the computer all day long. But, you know, why we try to ask them to limit screen time outside of uh, remote learning. Then we ask them about the amount of sugar sweetened beverages they are consuming. Uh, we ask about cultural factors around food. Uh, one of the other the big things is how many meals do you eat? How many dinners do you eat as a family? Because it has been shown that families that eat dinner together five to six days a week tend to be less obese. We ask about the number of takeout meals that they do per week. We ask about activities that they do uh, as a family. Uh, and you know, I would be remiss if I didn't address the impact of media. So food messaging is everywhere. It's, it's on, so it's on TV, it's, it's on uh, Facebook. You open Instagram, there's pictures of food. And, and when kids watch this, they're constantly bombarded by, by food and ads for food. So there was, a, there was a CEO of a big Fortune 500 food company who said this. They aren't children so much as, so much, but what I would like to call them evolving customers. So marketing starts very, very early. So about, in, in, at least in the US, 50% of the ads during children's programming are about food. And guess what? Most of them are not about healthy food. So food, junk food industry and the soft drink industry is, is huge. So they spend close to $2 billion per year on marketing to children. So this is huge. And, and you know there are activist groups which are working to limit this. It's actually illegal in, in many European countries to market food to kids. So we, we are trying very hard to kind of you know, curb this, but, but the lobbying is, is huge and the money involved is huge. So now, now when it comes to, so to, to comorbid issues with uh, obesity, it affects everything from head to toe. So we are going to go through some of, some of the issues. Of course, we are all aware of the cardiovascular issues. We are aware of the uh, psychosocial issues, uh, the risk of stroke, uh, the, the issues uh, about uh, on the liver, like uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Uh, musculoskeletal issues, uh, and also the risk of uh, cancer. So we, we assess the children for all of these things. So one big, big uh, thing that, that is, is treatable and uh, can be easily managed is obstructive sleep apnea. So many of these children, uh, when, we, when they screen positive for what is called the stop bang questionnaire, we, we refer them for a sleep study. We screen for, many of these tend to be asymptomatic, like pre-diabetes and diabetes and hypertension and hyperlipidemia. So we do labs for those. Uh, Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is on the rise in children. Uh, we, we screen for musculoskeletal issues like uh, Skiffy and Blount's disease. We also screen for the other uh, comorbidities. And we, we uh, also screen for, we have a mood questionnaire where we screen for depression and low self-esteem because there's a lot of bullying, there's a lot of shame around obesity. 
when we do a physical exam, you know, the vitals, one thing that I would like to emphasize, especially in this era of, of electronic medical records, we don't have to put, plug the height and weight into a calculator, get a BMI. You plug it into the EMR, it gives you a BMI. So every single child should have a BMI measure because obesity is not something that we can assess visually in children. They could look absolutely normal to you, but then they could have an abnormal DMI, a BMI if you actually calculate it. Then in, as part of the vital signs, you know, I'm a pediatric cardiologist, so I always check for blood pressure in the upper and lower extremities. It's, it would be pretty bad form if I were to miss a coarctation of the aorta in a hypertensive child. Uh, and also the right size cuff. The number of times I get referrals for childhood hypertension, where when we use the appropriate sized cuff, the blood pressure is normal. So it is very important. So we have different size cuffs depend, depending on the patient's size. We get a pulse oximetry, we get a waist and a neck circumference. The waist circumference uh, is an indicator for visceral adiposity. The neck circumference to screen for uh, sleep apnea. We look for dysmorphic features to rule out syndromes. Uh, the, the growth curves are really important uh, because, the, the, because of a factor called adiposity rebound. So we all know that, you know, we babe, kids have baby fat. In the first couple of years of life, they have what is called baby fat or puppy fat. Then they start losing weight. In, the, in between about two to five years, they lose weight. And then they start regaining weight. So it's, it's a J-shaped curve. So the earlier this weight gain starts, the earlier this adiposity rebound starts, the higher risk for later obesity. So it's very important to look at the growth chart and see when, when the weight gain started. Then we do a head to toe assessment to, to, to you know, do a full physical exam. We uh, specifically look for secondary sexual characteristics. Uh, this was something that I had to retrain myself to do as a, as a cardiologist. The only time I reached anywhere near the groin was to check ephemeral pulse. But now I do a full you know, uh, uh, exam for secondary sexual characteristics. I actually have a patient who is 11 years old uh, was Tanner for staging as far as her uh, sexual characteristics, had not attained menarche. She is 5'7 uh, in height and 260 pounds. So, and, and so that prompted me because she had not attained menarche that prompted me to check you know, her for insulin resistance and her, her insulin levels were sky high. And we were able to start her on metformin and now she you know, got her first period and is actually losing weight. So it is important to screen for precautious puberty as well as uh, delayed puberty. And we, and we also do a formal uh, mood assessment. So a couple of salient features on the uh, physical exam that I would like to highlight is the acanthosis nigricans. This is associated with uh, insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. It is very sad that you know uh, most parents think that this, is, this happens because the child is not taking a bath properly. I have had parents scolding children, oh my God, you're not washing your neck or you're not washing your armpit. That's why it's black. It's, it's, it's such a revelation to them when I, when I say, no, this is a medical condition. It's not like your child is not uh, practicing good hygiene. It's because the child is insulin resistant. Uh, we see gynecomastia in, in boys, uh, Blount's disease of the knee where it's, it's tibia vera, the bowing. We see, we look for stretch marks. Uh, not just uh, from the point of uh, weight gain or loss, but also to uh, screen for Cushing syndrome. We, uh, this skiffy slip capital femoral epiphysis it is, is a medical emergency because the femoral artery can be compressed. So they need immediate referral. So this, this happens because the head of the femur slides off the neck and the joint becomes unstable. So classically on an x-ray, this looks like an ice cream falling off a cone. So if this happens, they need an immediate referral to uh, an orthopedic specialist. So I'm gonna to briefly touch upon syndromic obesity because uh, you know, this is something that we, we need to rule out. Uh, clues to diagnosis include you know, very early onset, if they're born big, if they have dysmorphic features, if they had hypotonia or they have hypotonia, if they've had any developmental delays, if they are short, if, they, if their height is stunted, so these are all clues that, that should alert us to uh, a possible syndrome. So one, uh, there are some monogenic causes and there are, some, uh, there are lots of syndromes. 
So one monogenic cause, which is the most common cause of monogenic obesity is something called an MC4R mutation. It's the melanocortin-4 receptor mutation. It's found in about 6% of children with severe early onset obesity. So I'm actually, and, and these children tend to be tall. So I've actually, I'm actually screening the patient that I mentioned for an MC4R mutation. Unfortunately, there, there is no specific treatment for this, but at least you know, it gives us an answer as to why, why the child is obese. Now, there are treatable monogenic causes. Uh, one of them is the pro opio melanocortin uh, receptor or the leptin gene mutation. So there is a synthetic leptin called uh, set melanotide that's available. Uh, so these are treatable. Uh, the most important syndromes associated with Prader Willi, uh, with obesity include Prader Willi, which is the most common syndromic cause of obesity. There are also other things like Lawrence Moon Beetle, Beckwith Wiedemann, and Alstrom syndrome. So we, we screen for these things if there are any uh, red flags. So we, we uh, do a basic panel of labs. The AAP has guidelines on when to do what, but the children I get are already obese. So this is our basic uh, pediatric obesity panel. We do a, a comprehensive metabolic panel, which includes electrolytes, includes glucose, includes renal function, liver function, uh, and a, a hemoglobin A1C. A point to note here is that the cutoff values for ALT and ASD are pretty low in children. They are about 22. So I, I, these days I'm seeing kids who are like three times. I'm seeing kids who are, who are 12 to 15 and who have three, three to four times the normal limit of ALT and ASD. So that indicates actual hepatitis, not just fatty infiltration of the liver, but then when the enzymes are elevated, there is actual liver damage, which can lead to cirrhosis. So we check a uh, fasting lipid panel. The most common abnormality we will see is high triglycerides and low HDL but the other, you know, LDL can, can be high also. Uh, we, we, we rule out secondary causes like hypothyroidism. We wanna make sure that's uh, not a factor. We do a, a complete hemogram to make sure they're not anemic. And depending on, on the screen, on uh, what, you know, their exam and their history, we do other studies. If, if we're suspecting sleep apnea, we do a sleep study. If you're suspecting any renal involvement or hypertension, we do a urine. Uh, in kids that I strongly, I don't use coma IR uh, routinely, but in a child who has a strong suspicion for insulin resistance, I will do it. Uh, if we are suspecting Cushing's, then we do a dexamethasone suppression or a 24-hour urinary cortisol. Uh, and uh, for kids who are hypertensive to look for end organ damage, we you know, do an echocardiogram. Now the principles of management in obesity, there is no one size fits all, and there is no pill for one ill. So the, the treatment has to be family-based and it has to be age appropriate. We can't prescribe the same thing for a child who's six versus an adolescent who's 19. So it has to be tailored to the child's age. It has to be tailored to each family and their cultural beliefs. Uh, and we, we try to focus more on improvement of long-term health in terms of physical and mental health. And uh, by altering, making you know, sustained changes in behavior rather than focus on weight as a number. And we tailor the approach to each patient and each family and their comorbid factors. And the intervention starts from, from the least invasive and progresses depending on the response and the severity of obesity. Most of all, I, like, the first thing I tell children is that it's not your fault because people somehow, you know, even healthcare professionals think it's, it's obesity happens because it's a lack of control, lack of self-control. You eat too much or you're not exercising. It is a lot more complex than that. So I always tell the, tell the child, it's not your fault. You know, the, there are things that are stacked against you. Obesity is a chronic disease. It's complex. It's multifactorial. It's not just about self-control. So the, uh, the, the uh, AAP actually has a stage. Of course, the stage one is called a prevention plus. This can be done in a general pediatrician's office if they have the time. Which, which is a big factor. This emphasizes basic healthy eating, basic exercise and uh, modification behavior. And the outcome of this is to improve the child's BMI. So we have something called the 5210 rule. Five stands for eat at least you know, five or more servings of fresh fruits and vegetables a day. Now, now go tell that to somebody who, who doesn't have a job and is unemployed. Because guess what? A box of strawberries costs $8. 
So, so we also have to kind of, you know, be sensitive to what is, is possible and what is, is practical. Uh, we, we, we tell them, you know, eat the rainbow. Eat one fruit or vegetable from, you know, every color of the rainbow as possible. This is visually, you know, easier for the child to understand. And as we talked about screen time, two hours or less per day. And uh, the latest exercise guidelines for children are one hour or more of moderate to vigorous physical activity every single day of the week. Uh, and as far as sugar, sweet and beverages, zero. And we also have them make behavioral changes, try to give them recipes, easier ways to, you know, the, the, I, I know the women in the group will understand this, people who have an instant pot. Like, you know, we teach them easy recipes, dump all the ingredients, switch it on and you're done. So we, we teach them easier ways to make food at home. We encourage them to eat meals as a family without any distraction. No phones, no phones at the dinner table, no TV while you're eating. Uh, and we, we, tried, we, we uh, try to emphasize that the child needs to self-regulate hunger. Once the child feels full, they have permission to stop. And then we also try to involve children in the food prep so that they, they understand from a very early age what healthy eating is. Now, let's say we did this and it's been three to six months and nothing changed. Then we go on to the next stage. Now we start involving a nutritionist in the picture. We, we give them an actual planned structured diet and we plan snacks. So one, one of the easiest things to do is let's say we, we have them count out a certain number of grapes or count out a certain number of like not low calorie crackers, put them in little Ziploc bags. That's their snack so that they don't have to think. And we have them do it for the whole week so that every time they need a snack, they can just reach for the Ziploc bag and be done. And then we further, further try restrict screen time to less than an hour a day. Uh, we uh, sometimes involve trainers to, to uh, supervise and plan physical activity or the best thing is to put them in a sport so that they get regular exercise every day. And we encourage these patients to maintain food logs. This is really easy in this day and age because everybody has a smartphone and there are free apps that you, know, you can download and track your food during the day. There's, there's, you can track your activity during the day. And we emphasize uh, on um, reinforcement for good behavior and uh, for reaching targets, not, not the way, but the behavior. And we, and we tend to, tend to uh, structure non-food rewards. If a child loses five pounds, that doesn't mean that you get to go to McDonald's. It means that you get to do an activity that you like, or you get to go shop at a place that you like within, within reason. So we, we try to you know, devise non-food rewards for uh, good behavior. Now, stage three and four tend to, be, tend to get expensive. So they are best done at academic medical centers where we really need to intensify the behavioral changes. And these children need to be seen you know, as often as weekly. At least for the first two to three months, they need to be seen weekly. Uh, sometimes this is easier when, when doing it as a group visit, which, which is now not possible because of COVID, but then we used to do this when, you know, pre-COVID. So group visits so that they, they, they make friends, they exercise together, uh, and, and they're able to share their uh, issues. Now, now, we definitely have to involve the nutritionist at this point. They, the nutritionist helps them set short-term goals. Uh, and they help them plan for contingencies. So one of the problems we have is uh, in, in, in divided families, when the parents are divorced, the mother will often tell me, oh, when, when the child is at my house, you know, I feed them healthy food. When they go over to their fathers, everything goes out the window. They eat out all the time. So we help the child and the family plan for contingency. So what's gonna happen if you're going on a school trip? What's gonna happen if you're going out of town on a vacation? So we help them plan these things so that they have an eating plan for these contingencies. And at this stage, parental participation is mandatory. This, this the whole family has to be on board. And then we also systematically, every week we evaluate, uh, you know, physical activity, we evaluate the behavior. And uh, we also, at this point, start doing uh, body measurements. Stage four uh, is, is tertiary care. It has to be at an established pediatric obesity center with bariatric surgery available. Uh, it needs a multi, it's a, definitely it takes a village to do this. It needs a, not just the doctor and the nurse, it needs a nutritionist, an exercise physiologist, a social worker, and a psychologist. So this is when we start thinking about medications. 
Uh, and then in, 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 in severely obese adolescents, uh, we do sometimes recommend very low calorie diets with really close monitoring. Some of my patients, my older patients, adolescent patients actually have had success with intermittent fasting as long as they're they are eating healthy and they're eating enough. And then of course, uh, bariatric surgery with uh, which J Dave, uh, Dave Nath is gonna talk about. So what medications are approved uh, in kids? Uh, if you don't mind, Subhashini, uh, Dave Nath has to leave early. Okay. So, uh, okay. Maybe he should go now and we can take up the yeah. rest of it later. But, okay, yeah, yeah. No, it's okay. No um, how about you finish, Subhash? Don't worry, you can go uh, ahead. Just, just two, more, two more minutes. No worries. Okay, so there are only a couple of medications that are approved in kids. Arlistat is approved for uh, 12 and over. Fentramine is approved for kids who are 17 and over. Recently, you know, uh, the GLP-1 agonists have been approved for kids with diabetes, type 2 diabetes, but now we are using them off-label to treat obesity. Uh, when we do medications in kids, we have to be very aware of the long-term uh, safety and growth. A uh, couple of other things, iatrogenic weight gain that we talked about, metformin is pretty effective. Uh, kids with binge eating disorder, we use uh, lis uh, dexamphetamine, and we, of course, monitor closely for uh, deficiencies. Now, indication for bariatric surgery, I'm not going to go into this because I know Dave Nath is going to, going to do this, but basically, it's kids with BMI over 35 with a comorbidity or a BMI over 40. So what are the barriers here? One is the lack of awareness, not just among parents, but as, as doctors. We don't get enough training to treat obesity. And then the primary care pediatricians, they have to address multiple issues during a visit. So they don't have the time to sit and do all of the things that I, I mentioned. The third thing is weight bias. It's been shown that even among healthcare providers, there's a bias against, implicit bias. We don't obviously, you know, it's not explicit. There's an implicit bias against obese patients. And we talk a lot about socioeconomic and cultural factors. And, and the biggest thing, which, which it's my pet peeve, is the insurance. Insurance companies do not consider obesity a disease. So there is no incentive to treat it. It's too much work for too little money. Uh, to summarize, pediatric obesity is complex, chronic, progressive, and multifactorial. There are preconceptual uh, and uh, perinatal and postnatal factors. The incidence of severe obesity is rising. Uh, prevention and management should start in the womb and continue throughout life. We do have options to treat severely obese patients like medication and surgery. Addressing weight bias is important. And then the care should be uh, multidisciplinary. So I'm not gonna go through references. So this I wanted to show, this is my daughter. So this was the left, left hand side picture is of my daughter in 2019. She is 15 years old. She is in 10th grade. So, oh, so one of the good things that happened with remote schooling was that she started walking. She now walks eight to nine miles a day and she had time to plan out her diet. So over the past one and a half years, I'm really proud to say she has lost 50 pounds. So yes, I have family history of obesity. I am obese, she was obese, but then she was able to change it just by the diet and the exercise. So I'm really, really proud of her. So, and like I said, I, I have a lifelong struggle with obesity. That's why I'm so passionate about this. The left-hand side picture is me in 2014. The right-hand side is, is now. So my personal experience, so every single thing that a patient tells me or I ask or tell the patient, I have done. It. So I, I can put myself in their shoes and understand what they are going through and kind of tailor my, my treatment and my management to their needs. And it's extremely, extremely gratifying even though it doesn't pay, it's extremely gratifying. Thank you for your attention. Dr. Subhashini, an outstanding talk, very comprehensive. You have touched on almost all the details that somebody needs to know. I certainly will ask my patients, parents, and the grandparents, especially in an Indian nuclear family to actually have a look at this and go through all this. And uh, I mean, I, I think we are running a little short of time and, uh, Dr. Devnath needs to go on. It was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Okay, you're doing great work. Uh, I think everyone in a pediatric speciality is suffering from la lack of income, so don't worry. We are all in this together. Yep. Yep. We are all in this together. Yep. So don't worry at all. It's just that the joy and the happiness we get out of yep. uh, uh, treating children and the fact that we are creating a very healthy future for the country, I think that's what keeps us going. That's perfectly all right. All the best, great stuff. 
Wonderful. I'm so happy Vidya asked me to be part of this because I've learned a lot from listening to you. Greatly structured approach, a wonderful approach. Uh, great stuff. And I think I will also speak to the Indian Academy of Pediatrics to get you on board in their obesity program. And uh, they need to have a very structured, as you rightly said, our pediatric physicians don't have time for this. But I think the uh, the tsunami is upon us and we, need, we really need to look out for it. Thank you. I'm going to get started if it's okay. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Um, Sounds good. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. That was a fascinating talk, uh, Dr. Subhashini. Um, it's, it's, as Dr. Sripadi uh, described it, it's a tsunami and that affects all of us. I'm going to share my screen here. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, Dave. Perfect. Yes. So, uh, um, thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Dr. Vidya. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, Dr. Sripadi, thank you for uh, your kind words and for moderating this session. It's truly an honor for me to be here and, um, and share my thoughts on, on, this, on this epidemic of, of childhood obesity. Um, I'm a pediatric anesthesiologist at Children's Hospital Colorado, um, and, and I definitely see um, several children showing up for various different types of surgery. Um, and, and the obesity epidemic is definitely upon us. Um, I have no financial disclosures. And, and as uh, Dr. Subhashini mentioned, uh, this, this, the obesity epidemic in children, it's, it's a complex interplay of, of, of a combination of, of genetic factors, metabolic factors, environmental factors. Um, and it's just not just diet. There's things definitely beyond that. It's fascinating to hear about all the epigenetic stuff and the and that, that Dr. Subhashini was talking about. So as she mentioned, this, the epidemic of obesity affects just about every organ system in the body from the cardiovascular to endocrine system, um, the pulmonary system, et cetera. And what I'm hoping to do over the next 30 minutes or so is give you a very brief overview of the perioperative implications of childhood obesity, how it affects uh, the anesthetic management and what are my thoughts as a, you know, as a pediatric anesthesiologist as I care for these children? So I'll be focusing my talk into four parts, talk initially about the preoperative evaluation, um, talk about the things we do differently in the intraoperative management, the postoperative care, and finally, I'll, I'll, I'll touch upon adolescent uh, pediatric surgery. So as far as the preoperative evaluation is concerned, as Dr. Subhashini mentioned, um, a detailed history and a physical examination is critical. So in addition to like listening to the lungs and like listening to the heart sounds, doing a complete physical exam to see, you know, what is the status of their comorbidities, looking for signs of insulin resistance, such as acanthosis nigricans, looking for, um, looking at their airway, you know, are they, um, what is, what is their mullen party classification of their airway? Like, you know, are they a you know, a difficult, uh, do they look like they're going to be a difficult to intubate? Is mask ventilation going to be an issue, et cetera? So a comp I cannot emphasize this enough, a comprehensive history and physical examination every time you are going to be taking care of a child. Um, as a part of the preoperative assessment, something we also worry about is, are they medically optimized? So, you know, what is if the, if the children have diabetes, if they have hypercholesterolemia, if they have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or or, or NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatosis, what is the current status of their liver function or, or their you know, glycemic control, et cetera? So are they medically optimized to be, or to be ready for surgery? And so I think it's really critical that as, as pediatric care providers, we are familiar with the comorbidities that affect these children. Um, Dr. Subhashini briefly talked, talked about obstructive sleep apnea. And that's something obviously that's very near and dear to anesthesiologists because we deal with the airway and we are concerned about respiratory complications in the perioperative area. And something we know is that both obesity and obstructive sleep apnea are very closely linked. In fact, childhood obesity kind of quadruples the risk of OSA. Uh, for every unit increase in BMI, the risk of OSA increases were about 12%. So a lot of these children actually have moderate to severe OSA when they care for, for pediatric patients. 
I mean, look at the pathophysiology of OSA in obstructive, uh, in, in obese children. It's just not adenotonsillar hypertrophy. Yes, that is a major factor because of like, obviously because of increased somatic growth and because they have a normal, a smaller airway compared to, uh, you know, a, a same, like a normal weight child, uh, because of the increased uh, size of the tonsils and adenoids, they are going to have obstructive sleep apnea. But in addition to this, there are other things that also contribute to the severity of OSA in these obese children. They tend to have higher critical airway closing pressures. And also because of the heavy weight and adipose tissue on their chest wall, that affects the chest wall mechanics. They can have abnormal abnormalities in ventilatory control as well. So, so as you can see, the pathophysiology of obstructive sleep apnea in obese children is actually multifactorial. It's just not about the adenotonsillar hypertrophy. Now, it'd be nice to get a polysomnography or a sleep study in, in all these children, but the truth is the majority of patients that I take care of do not have a sleep study. It's expensive, it's difficult to schedule. So while it's a, a considered the gold standard for obstructive sleep apnea, the most of the children I take care of have not had a sleep study. But the few that have, the things that I look out for are, you know, when I look at the sleep study is, is like, is, do the does the child have central or is it obstructive sleep apnea? What is the apnea hypopnea index? Now, um, apnea refers to the episodes of complete cessation of airflow that happens uh, during the sleep study and that they add that up during the, like over the course of an hour. And hypopnea refers to the, uh, is, is partial cessation of airflow. So more than 50% obstruction of airflow during the sleep study. And that's associated with usually some desaturation. So they usually add up the apneic episodes and the hypopneic episodes to calculate something known as the apnea hypopnea index. And this kind of gives you an understanding of how severe the, uh, the OSA is in these children. And another important thing to consider is what is the nature of their pulse oximeter? So in children less than in, with, with, with severe OSA, it's often common to see SP donatus less than 80%. So, and, and most of the times the saturations are dropping below 80% during sleep. Um, and it's important to know that and to expect it in the post-operative period as well. But again, as I mentioned, a sleep study is, is nice to get, but the majority of the patients do not have a sleep study. So, um, and, and pediatric OSA is slightly different than um, adult OSA. Um, and the criteria that we use to classify the severity of OSA is, 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 is different in children. Um, in, so in, in children, a mild OSA is said to exist when the apnea hypopnea index is between two to four events an hour, as opposed to in adults, um, up to five is considered normal. Moderate OSA is up, um, five to nine episodes and severe OSA is, is more than 10 episodes of apnea hypopnea over the course of the hour. And as I mentioned previously, in most of the patients with severe OSA, they have uh, oxygen nadirs in, in less than 80%. So their saturations are less than 80% when they're falling asleep. Um, so just to summarize about the sleep study, it's, it's the gold standard, um, but rarely do we have patients who have these um, so much data, but every time we have the sleep study, we can do, uh, evaluate the sleep study to see how bad the OSA is and treat them accordingly in the operating room. So Dr. Subhashini mentioned the uh, stop bank questionnaire that we use that very commonly in adults, but in children, um, uh, we use a slightly different score. Um, it's known as the Stuber score to calculate the degree of uh, uh, OSA and to kind of, we use it as a predictor for perioperative respiratory adverse events. So every child that presents to our operating room, we calculate something known as the Stuber score. So it, it involves asking five questions. So does your child snore more than half the time? Does your child snore loudly? So that means you can hear it outside the bedroom. Does your child have any difficulty breathing? Have you ever noticed that your child stops breathing at night? And does your child wake up feeling unrefreshed the next morning? Or how has it, how has this sleep apnea affected your child's school performance? Does your child have ADHD in school, et cetera? So these are five questions that we ask every patient as part of our standard preoperative evaluation is and, and uh, on every patient that presents to us uh, to kind of predict what the rates of perioperative respiratory complications are. 
So if the Stuber score is more than three, it's likely that you know, you're going to have a patient who's going to have a perioperative respiratory adverse event. And so we obviously, which means that we minimize the amount of narcotics we give, we um, do monitoring postoperatively or it, it consider admitting the patient overnight, et cetera. So these are things that we do based on what the Stuber score is preoperatively. Um, in fact, the, we have, because of electronic medical records, if you have a patient with a Stuber score more than five, up to five, um, and we want to prescribe a long acting narcotic, it'll ask you, there's an automatic reminder that comes up saying that your patient has a super score of five. Do you, are you sure you want to prescribe the hydromorphone or the morphine because it's a long acting narcotic? So we use the super score as a predictor of perioperative respiratory adverse events in our, in our children, especially those with uh, bad uh, obstructive sleep apnea. Um, the, another thing about of childhood obesity and obstructive sleep apnea is that even after taking on the tonsils and adenoids, residual OSA is very common. That's going to be very frustrating. So most of these children have had an adenotonsillectomy and they still have residual OSA and that's something to consider uh, and keep in mind. As I mentioned before, children, obese children with obstructive sleep apnea are at an increased risk of respiratory adverse events and should be monitored. Um, in fact, when you look at admission criteria after tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy, we have several things. So like a child less than three years of age, um, a child who is obese, a child who has Down syndrome, a child who has other craniofacial abnormalities, et cetera. They're all indications for admitting the children overnight for monitoring after a tonsillectomy. So as I mentioned before, childhood obesity um, is uh, uh, actually severe obesity is one of the indications for admitting these patients because it's kind of dangerous to send them home after having a tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy because they are at increased risk of perioperative respiratory adverse events. Another important thing I wanted to point out is that these obese children with severe um, um, obstructive sleep apnea are extremely sensitive to opioids. Um, and because of the chronic hypoxemia that these children have, they have an upregulation of the immune receptors, of the opioid immune receptors, and so they're very sensitive to opioids. In fact, they can, you can get away with using half the doses of the long-acting narcotics that you can use. So uh, this is especially important when you're prescribing opioids to, to, to children, um, especially those with obstructive sleep apnea. And along the same front, the use of dexmedetomidine has been a game changer because we use it routinely to reduce the amount of opioids we end up needing during the, you know, during the perioperative phase. Now, as far as uh, preoperative instructions for these obese children, as I mentioned, uh, these children present to the operating room for a variety of indications from, from circumcisions to, um, to hernia surgery to um, fractures to whatever, right? So a wide range of surgeries are being performed um, on these obese children. Um, and so do we need to do anything differently as far as our preoperative instructions go? Um, now it's well known that these children are not at an increased risk of aspiration compared to like normal weight children. So we use the standard NPO guidelines uh, when, we, uh, when we counsel them preoperatively. If they are taking um, CPAP, the older, especially the older children with severe OSA, if they are on CPAP therapy, we ask them to bring it to the hospital because, so that we can use it in the postoperative period. And you know, if they're admitted overnight at the hospital, we can use their home CPAP um, in the hospital. Another big question is, should these be patients be cared for in an ambulatory setting or should they be inpatient? As I mentioned before, uh, in my personal opinion, if a child has, has moderate to severe obesity, they should, not, they should be admitted overnight after um, an airway surgery such as a tonsillectomy so they can be monitored postoperatively. As far as pre-medications go, a lot of our children are very anxious going to the operating room. And so we routinely give our children either midazolam or some other anxiolytic. And while, while dosing anxiolytics, you have to be very careful in obese children because again of this increased risk of perioperative respiratory adverse events. As far as induction of general anesthesia, um, children, especially obese children, have a decreased functional residual capacity and they have increased VQ mismatch. So they're prone to hypoxemia on induction. And so that's why adequate pre-oxygenation is really important. Usually it's tidal breathing, 100% oxygen, with just a little bit of CPAP, it really helps to kind of buy more time and so make sure that they are adequately pre-oxygenated. Another maneuver that really helps is keeping their head slightly up. 
So we avoid the supine position as much as possible. So a little bit of reverse Trendelenburg or slightly head up position really again offloads the weight of their at like you know, their belly um, on the diaphragm and it increases their FRC and it makes a big difference. Um, as I mentioned to you before, not all obese children are at an increased risk of aspiration. And so they don't need a rapid sequence induction um, and we have standard uh, preoperative NPO guidelines. So they're not at an increased risk of aspiration. And so you don't need to do a rapid sequence for all these patients. Something that has made a big difference as far as every management is this concept of using a ramped position. So on the left in panel A is what you see the standard sniffing position, the standard pillow under the, under the neck, but in obese children and obese patients, especially in, in the adults, adolescents and the adults, using a ramped position. And so you imagine a line between the external auditory meatus and the sternum. And if that's a straight line, you have achieved a good ramped position for direct laryngoscopy, and it makes a big difference. Um, so difficult intubation is rarely an issue. Um, in fact, we don't even use a glide scope or a video laryngoscope for our, our intubations in our obese adolescents. We depend on you know, standard direct laryngoscopy, but we ensure that we position these patients using blankets under their shoulder and then extra blankets so that you can get them in this ramp position. Um, and again, as I mentioned to you before, this also gets the head up. It takes the weight off the diaphragm um, and it makes a big difference as far as intubating these patients. I also want to point out that, you know, obese children, severely obese children might be at an increased risk of mask, like bag mask ventilation, but usually uh, with a two-hand technique, they usually, um, you can mask ventilate them and direct laryngoscopy, you know, the use of the ramp position, I think has been a game changer for us. As far as intraoperative ventilation strategies go, we usually use lung protective ventilation strategies using like lower tidal volumes. And we try to base it off their ideal body weight rather than using their, um, you know, their total body weight or the actual body weight. And the way we calculate this ideal body weight is we use something known as the 50% BMI percentile method where we can calculate their, 50, uh, their BMI at their 50th percentile and then multiply that by square of the height in meters to calculate their ideal body weight. So this is a bit of an extra step in, you know, in, in calculating what body scale are you gonna be used, whether it's for ventilation strategies or for drugs you're using. So I, that's how we calculate the ideal body weight. We use low tidal volumes and lung protective ventilation strategies. And often we're using modest levels of PEEP. So 10 to 15 centimeters of PEEP to maintain their FRC. Um, and occasionally they will require intermittent alveolar recruitment maneuvers so that to get, get rid of atelectasis. Um, as I mentioned to you before, the head up position is a big deal. Uh, make sure we never try to extubate them in the, you know, the supine position, get their head up prior to extubating and make sure that they're fully awake before we extubate them. Something that Dr. Subhashini mentioned was using an appropriate size blood pressure cuff. And because sometimes of the conical shape of their of their arms, we have to use alternative sites for checking their blood pressure. So it could be a blood pressure cuff on their forearm or on their leg, because um, the normal blood pressure cuff will, will does not fit properly in their arm. And so we always look for in, um, alternative sites uh, for checking their blood pressures. And you wanna make sure that you're using an appropriate size blood pressure cuff. Rarely do we place uh, arterial lines for hemodynamic monitoring, but you know, if you're not able to get a good blood pressure or if you don't have an appropriate size blood pressure cuff, you might be forced to do that. Because of increased adipose tissue, you have the potential for you know, low voltage EKG signals, but that's again, rarely an issue. Um, and we just look for you know, whatever best signals we can get um, in these morbidly obese children. Another thing to keep in mind is often there's a mismatch between the entire CO2 and the PSCO2 in the blood gas um, because of the VQ mismatch. And that's something that you just have to keep in mind as you're ventilating these patients. Positioning wise, I've, I, I think I've hopped on this enough. Avoid the supine position as much as possible. Uh, Trendelenburg is even worse probably because of all the weight that gets transmitted the diaphragm and to the lungs. And so making sure that you have a head up especially when you're extubating and during the initial uh, pre-oxygenation intubation, I think is critical. Um, and obese patients also at an increased risk of peripheral nerve injuries and such as, you know, injuring the ulnar nerve and other, the common peripheral nerve in the leg. And so 
adequate padding is really important when you're positioning these patients on the operating table. Um, as far as pain control afterwards, you know, I've mentioned to you that these patients are at an increased risk of, of adverse respiratory events. And so we try to use, do regional anesthetic techniques if they're available, if that's an option. Um, and you know, that could be for either doing regional blocks or doing local anesthetic infiltration and using multimodal analgesia. So using a combination of estaminophen and, and ketorolac. And as I mentioned to you before, the use of dexmetomidine has been a game changer for us because it reduces the amount of opioids we have to give them. And I wanna again emphasize that these patients, with child, these obese children, especially the ones with obstructive sleep apnea are at an increased risk for these perioperative respiratory events. And so you should be very careful giving opioids to them. Um, so I've talked about calcutaneous pulse oximetry for these patients afterwards. Um, if, if your patient is in the hospital overnight, consider continuous pulse oximetry. We talked about multimodal analgesia and have an individualized plan as far as discharge is concerned. But that's some things that we obviously have to do on a case by case basis. I wanna switch gears a little bit and talk about adolescent bariatric surgery. And so uh, we have a fairly busy uh, bariatric surgery program in our hospital. Uh, one, we, uh, one of our surgeons, Dr. Thomas Ainge joined us, I think three years back and, and we just have completed so far 100 adolescent bariatric surgery cases. And as Dr. Subhashini mentioned, it's a village that you require to do these. It's just not the surgeon operating in, in silo with, with, with his team. Um, this is a multidisciplinary program. They are bariatric surgeons, they are endocrinologists, they are psychologists, dietitians, uh, gynecologists, pulmonologists. And it's, it's just an entire team that takes care of these patients. Um, and, and, you know, I, I serve as the, um, the liaison for our Dallas and bariatric surgery program. And, and we've com just completed close to 100 cases at our, at our institution. And I have a QR code at the, on the last slide that takes you to, to the website. So as far as the surgeries for um, um, you know, adults and bariatric surgery, there are two options currently that's commonly done in, in, in dialysis. One is the ruin y gastric bypass, and the second one is the vertical sleeve gastrectomy. Both of these procedures are laparoscopic procedures. So we rarely do we have to do an open procedure. So it's a laparoscopic procedure. And the vertical sleeve gastrectomy is kind of taking off as the more popular approach. Um, and we've done way more sleeve gastrectomies than the, the, the gastric bypass. So essentially the sleeve gastrectomy involves um, removing about 80% of the stomach by doing basically by they take out the entire greater curvature of the stomach by using staples um, and they reduce the size of the, of the, of the new stomach. In a ruin by gastric bypass, it's, it's, they also create a small gastric pouch and then they bypass um, at about 10 to 15 centimeters of geodenum and jejunum by creating that ruin Y loop. Um, obviously, it's slightly more involved operation compared to a sleeve gastrectomy, but you know, as I mentioned to you before, the sleeve is definitely the more common procedure uh, that we perform at our center. And uh, um, when you look at adolescent bariatric surgery, there are two major studies. There's the PCORNET study and the other NEJM paper, and I'll talk about both of these. When you look at the PCORNET study, this is the, uh, I think it was, it was a multi-center study that looked at the effectiveness of bariatric procedures on, among the adolescents. Um, you know, I think they have looked at close to 545 bariatric surgery procedures done in adolescents. And as this graph shows, um, the sleeve gastrectomy has become the more common. So it went up from about 18% in the early 2000s to current, right now about 85% of the cases are this, um, this um, sleeve gastrectomies. And as you can see, the ruin Y gastric cases started at 50% and now they're downtrending towards about 25%. And adjustable gastric bands, which used to be done in adults, is no longer being performed in children. So as you can see here, sleeve gastrectomy has become the preferred surgical approach. And both the sleeve gastrectomy and the ruin Y gastric bypass are effective in, in lowering the BMI. And they, use, and they both of them average about a 30% reduction in their BMI after surgery. Um, the, as, as this graph shows, the adjustable gastric band is no longer performed, especially in adolescents. Just to reemphasize this, 
that uh, Dr. Subhashini talked about is the different classes of severe obesity. And um, I wanted to show this before I talk about the indications for doing adolescent bariatric surgery. So class two is between 120 to 140% of the 95th percentile or BMI between 35 and 39. And class three is greater than 140% or the BMI greater than 40. So what are the indications for adolescent bariatric surgery? They're twofold. So one is having a BMI greater than 35 or greater than 120%. And these patients should have a, a severe comorbidity. So either a sleep apnea, type two diabetes, idiocratic intracranial hypertension, the non-alcoholic steroidhepatosis, the skiffy, reflux, hypertension, et cetera. So they all have comorbidities and they have a BMI greater than 35 or 120%. The other major indication is the BMI greater than 40. Um, and you don't have to have a, a coma to qualify for adolescent bariatric surgery. And as Dr. Subhashini mentioned, adolescent bariatric surgery is usually not the first step. They go through all their levels of care and only if they have failed all these other treatments that she talked about that we consider this. And it's just not that they just show up for adolescent uh, bariatric surgery and they get it. It's like a, it's a long process to qualify. And, and then, you know, it's a multidisciplinary program where there's involvement of the endocrinologist, nutritionist, um, and, and it's, a, it's a pretty lengthy approach before they're gonna qualify for the surgery. A comprehensive preoperative assessment is critical. They should be able to commit to all the things that are, they're expected to do before and after surgery. Um, in the past, they used to have tannus surging and physical maturity as one of the indications that has been removed recently, um, but they have to be physically and emotionally ready for this. Um, they have a very comprehensive medical evaluation. They meet with the psychologist, the nutritionist, they get lab work as Dr. Subhashini mentioned, and they meet with specialists as needed before they can qualify for this surgery. There are very few contraindications. If it's a medically correctable cause or if there's an ongoing substance abuse problem within the, within the last one year, that'd be a contraindication to doing an adolescent bariatric surgery or if there's a psychiatric condition that prevents them from adhering to the, what we ask them to do. Another uh, contraindication is if pregnancy is planned within the next year or so. Um, so that's a contraindication as well. So currently when we perform adolescent bariatric surgery procedures in females, one of the things that we do along in the same anesthetic is place an IUD so they can't get pregnant within the next um, year or year and a half after the surgery. And the IUD is removed usually after that period. So these are the limited number of contraindications to having adolescent bariatric surgery. The second paper I wanna talk about is the uh, NEJM, the New England Journal of Medicine paper that looked at five-year outcomes of this gastric bypass or bariatric surgeries in adolescents and they compared it to adults. So LAB stands for Longitudinal Assessment of Bariatric Surgery. So they compared teen labs, which are close to 161 adolescents having this bariatric surgery and they compared it to labs in adults, which was for close to 400 patients, uh, 18 years or older, who are having bariatric surgery. And this was a paper that was published in NEGM in 2019. And what it basically showed is that in both teenagers or adolescents and in adults, there's a close to anywhere from 26 to 30% weight loss after bariatric surgery. But this, what was more interesting was that there was remission of diabetes. So 86% of the adolescents and uh, had complete remission of diabetes um, after undergoing bariatric surgery, as opposed to 53% of adults. And so when you look at their medication use, about 88% of the teenagers were on some diabetic medication pre-op, um, similar to about 79% in adults. But they found that at the five-year mark, none of the teenagers required any kind of medication for diabetes whereas a quarter of the adults still were on some kind of diabetes medication. So what they basically showed that the, uh, the bariatric surgery was more effective in the remission of diabetes in, these, in this adolescent population compared to adults. Similarly, they also found a very impressive remission of hypertension. 68% of the adolescents had complete remission of hypertension, whereas opposed to only about 40% of the, of the adults had that. So, uh, bariatric surgery was more effective in treating the hypertension and getting rid of the type two diabetes in these children, um, you know, compared to, compared to the adults. Again, this is the hypertensive data 
uh, the, at baseline, 57% of the teenagers had died, were on some kind of hypertensive medication, and only one in 10 of them required some medicine after the five-year period, as opposed to one-third of the adults have, were still taking some kind of antihypertensive medication after five years after the bariatric surgery. So, um, but one of the issues that they definitely noticed a difference was that uh, the, uh, the, both the, the, the teenagers who had adolescent bariatric surgery had an increased risk of micronutrient deficiency, so low ferritin levels, low vitamin B12, um, compared to their ad adult partners. And so nutritional supplementation, making sure that they're taking these vitamins and, and iron pills is, is a big deal of, as a part of the counseling. Um, and they feel that these differences of micronutrient deficiencies between adolescents and, and, and adults is because of the compliance of, of taking these medications. The PCORNET study also looked at complications after the surgery and found that, you know, they were rare. So within about 544 patients, there were no deaths in the adolescent group um, and they required some kind of a, a post-operative intervention, only about 3.3% of the patients. Things like a venous thromboembolism is a, they are at an increased risk. And so all our patients get um, heparin subcutaneously um, as for venous thromboembolism prophylaxis. The rate of any 30-day events were also rare um, at 5% in the bariatric surgery group. To summarize, what I've talked about is is the perioperative implications of obesity, what we are worried about as anesthesiologists. I talked about the comprehensive preoperative evaluation, things we do differently intraoperatively, and finally, nuggets for postoperative care. And I also briefly touched upon um, the, our bariatric surgery program, talking about the indications, the contraindications, the surgical approaches, and, and the outcomes data, which has been shown to in a carefully selected group of patients, adolescent bariatric surgery seems to be effective um, in, in treating their diabetes, hypertension. So it's almost like you're taking care of these complications in their early age and before it becomes too bad to like, you know, take care of it as adults. Um, that's my email address and you can scan this QR code which takes you to about our bariatric surgery program. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Dr. Devnath, uh, brilliant. I was told uh, before this meeting that you're an accomplished speaker and that you know your talks are a treat to, uh, to listen to and wonderful. Uh, can I just ask you a question? And uh, one of them is you spoke about the ramped up position. Uh, is this something that you know uh, an obese adolescent can use as a sleeping position if they are uh, snoring and will it help them to do that? Um. It, it probably will help with, with the snoring. Um, it's not very comfortable to sleep like that because you know, they're pretty ramped up. Um, so I do not know how compliant they will be, uh, but it definitely helps like, you know, um, I think it will help with, uh, you know, with their snoring. Um, if they have severe or obstructive sleep apnea, they should have a formal sleep study if that's an option and consider getting um, continuous CPAP. Um, the, and that's a CPAP device will probably be the most effective. Um, but if they don't have access to it, I, I think the ramp position will be a good, good idea. Good idea. The other thing is you did speak about gastric banding and said it wasn't very helpful. The sleeve gastrectomy to me seems to be an irreversible procedure. Is that, uh, is that a fair comment or? Uh, yeah. You... Yes, uh, you're absolutely correct. The, the sleeve gastrectomy is irreversible. They remove about 80% of the, the size of the stomach. Um, and, uh, you know, but postoperative complications are fairly rare. The, the issues with the adjustable gastric bands is that they're not very effective. They often get dislodged, um, but obviously the big benefit is they're reversible. You can just remove the gastric band. Um, I, I, I do not want, know what the data is in adults, but as I can definitely say in, in, in adolescents, uh, we don't perform the gastric band anymore. It's actually either the sleeve gastrectomy or the run Y. Uh, for the, for the surgery. When you spoke about the Stuber score, what struck me was, should we, should we be doing it for all our daycare procedures? Should we bring it into a practice, uh, what do you call that protocol to make sure that we are not sending these children home as daycare surgeries? Or does it apply only for head and neck and not for other surgery? Suppose you're doing a genital urinary procedure, would the Stuber score still be relevant to decide whether they should be daycare or in-house? 
So um, we use the Stuber score in every patient that's having any surgery. So it's a part of our standard preoperative assessment. In fact, I will not. Be, they won't let me sign my record unless I have assigned the Stuber score to every patient. So the the pleasures of dealing with EMR. But um, so we use it routinely on all our patients having um, um, have regardless of what surgery they're having. We pay more attention to it when we're doing airway procedures like ENT procedures, et cetera, because we're concerned about the perioperative like respiratory adverse events. But if you have a, 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 an obese um, toddler who's having a circumcision or, or a, a, a more invasive uh, urological procedure, they are also at an increased risk of, of respiratory events uh, postoperatively. And I think it's important that we risk stratify these patients. And if they have a very high Stuber score, you know, you should consider um, admitting them, obviously minimizing narcotics, using local anesthetics or regional blocks, um, and, and, you know, making sure that they're monitored post-op. I, I was a little uh, uh, concerned when you spoke about putting them in a steep uh, trend, uh, trend line work at the time of surgery. In robotics, often that is required, as Dr. Radhakrishna will agree with me, we often require to put them in a steep uh, trend line work for pelvic surgeries. And uh, this, I think it raises a lot of concerns and perhaps we need to touch base with you a little bit later on that. But anyway, if, uh, if it's okay with you, I am going to recommend to our Pediatric Surgical Society to have you on board to give a talk on this because this is something that's extremely important that all surgeons involved in the care of children need to hear. So thank you very much for an outstanding talk. And uh, I will hand you over to, uh, to Dr. Vidya. Uh, thank yeah. you, sir. Uh, Dr. Parvati, a pediatric endocrinologist uh, at Aster, uh, has joined us. Dr. Parvati, would you like to say a few words about the endocrine aspect of uh, pediatric obesity in general and adolescent uh, obesity in particular? We have one question, Vidya, from Dr. Ravi Shankar. After Dr. Parvati finishes, maybe Dr. Ravi Shankar can ask that question. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Vidya, for this for um, letting me participate in this wonderful discussion on pediatric obesity, a less discussed topic. Uh, so basically, as a, a pediatric endocrinologist, mostly we are called upon uh, uh, to rule out a hormonal cause for the obesity. So basically, uh, we know that the hormonal causes for obesity would be something less than 10%. We have mostly an exogenous cause. So the rule of thumb that we use in the uh, pediatric endocrine clinic would be the uh, number one would be, especially in children, would be the growth rate of a child. So the growth rate of the child is affected. If there is a standard growth, definitely I would like to rule out an endocrine cause or a genetic cause. Uh, but that there could be exceptions. For example, in a Cushing syndrome child who, who is an adolescent who has completed growth. So it depends on the point you're capturing the child. So there could be exceptions. So it's well, the most important thing would be the growth rate of the child. So usually exogenous obesity or a simple obesity has an accelerated growth rate. And most of the times these obese children, they never come to the physician or the multiple specialist uh, for the concern of the obesity. They uh, come to the pediatric surgeon or the urologist for a apparent micropenis. They could come to the dermatologist for the acanthosis and uh, they could come to the pediatrician with other problems. And when the obesity is picked up, they could go to the gynecologist for a, uh, for a uh, appearance of a thelarchy and some Sometimes they come to the pediatric endocrinologist. So the examination and Dr. Subhashini was mentioning it in detail. So uh, one point I would like to add on to the uh, anthropometry part would be the measurement of the waist circumference. Definitely body mass index is the uh, most practical uh, uh, aspect in uh, assessing a, or a screening for obesity. Uh, definitely waist circumference and we have waist circumference centiles for Indian children put up by Dr. Khadilka. So waist circumference basically predicts the uh, increased chance of a metabolic syndrome in these children. And uh, identifying a cause for obesity before, uh, uh, when you consider the perioperative care of an obese child, definitely identifying the cause is very important, especially when you have a genetic cause uh, like a Prader-Willi syndrome. Uh, the treatment has definitely a, a lot of importance in uh, prognosticating. For example, growth hormone treatment is very important in uh, uh, the even in the obesity part and also the other developmental part of a Prader-Willi uh, syndrome. So identifying the Prader-Willi syndrome uh, by an endocrinological evaluation is very important. And another important point I would like to mention would be the uh, sexual maturity rating, which is very important. And the other thing which is often missed off by the pediatricians would be a SGA child, an SGA or IUGR baby 
tracking the children. For example, uh, most of our SGA babies are being followed up in a SGA clinic in the pediatric endocrine clinic from around four years of age. That would be the because uh, I know the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends uh, intervention if they do not fall to the centiles by two years. But in an Indian scenario, by four years, if they don't come to the centiles, definitely they need an evaluation of the growth hormone axis. And also these SGA children, they have a, a increased chance of uh, developing the uh, metabolic complications if they develop a increased catch-up growth. So it's very important to track the uh, weight for height centiles, especially in a less than two-year-old who is an SGA and with BMI later on. And another point, uh, so in the uh, group of the, multi, I mean, the uh, specialists, definitely the role of a pediatric pulmonologist I would consider uh, important because assessing a, a obstructive sleep apnea, so definitely you have the scoring system, but even without the symptoms, obstructive sleep apnea could be present in a uh, class two or a class three obesity and also in a syndromic child. So it's very important to assess for obstructive sleep apnea, especially in a perioperative care, because that could affect your uh, prognosis and post-operative complications. So these were the few points which I wanted to mention and also screening for diabetes, uh, uh, getting a, a oral glucose tolerance test, especially prior to surgery. Yeah, these were the points I wanted to mention. Thank you, Dr. Parvati. If Dr. Ravishankar is there, uh, Ravishankar, can you can you go ahead by asking your question, please? Um, sure. Uh, so actually, uh, uh, it's more than a question. I am a pediatric endocrinologist as well, um, and um, you know my current role is in drug development. And one of the things um, that we have seen uh, persistently is that um, other than pretty drastic measures such as bariatric surgery uh, or some sort of medication, um, most of the other uh, um, techniques, the non-pharmacologic uh, you know, non measures, really don't work very well. There are many, many, many studies that have looked at school-based interventions to treat um, childhood obesity in the United States, hardly made any dent children's um, knowledge about healthy foods and healthy habits increased, but it didn't make any difference to their BMI percentiles. Um, uh, there's a study from Japan which says that less than 6% of uh, patients actually respond to diet and exercise and uh, counseling advice. So it's, it's, it's a major problem. I think a lot of this has to do more with the adage that prevention is so much better than cure. Um, and, and when it comes to prevention, it's not a village that's required, it's a country that's required. You need uh, um, you know, laws and guidelines and you know, things about what do you stack in uh, stock in vending machines? Um, you know, what kind of access do children have to food? Um, how do you... Um, culturally set expectations for healthy weight in children, et cetera. It's, it's, it's a huge issue. But along those things, I would also like to mention a couple of other things. I mean, yes, waist circumference is really useful, um, but a waist to height ratio might be even better because the uh, uh, gender and age-based differences usually are very minimal uh, when you normalize it for uh, height. The other thing that I've noticed uh, particularly is that this, uh, you know, acanthosis is a very, um, um, you know, um, racial thing. I mean, we hardly ever see it in Caucasian patients, uh, but it's very, very easily advisable. I mean, very easily visible in um, any dark raced uh, child like the Hispanics, the African Americans, the Asian kids. It's, 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 it's actually quite easy to, to figure it out. But I think, but more than any of these things, I just saw Dr. Parvati's message that the uh, ICMR charts for the Indian kids are available. Actually, there are WHO BMI charts as well for countries that don't have their own data. So, um, and um, uh, one thing that is very interesting is that like in adult in, uh, um, you know, uh, Indians, there are racial differences in body fat content. So for, uh, uh, so the thin fat, phenotype is, is, is very common among the um, among Indians. A um, lot of visceral obesity for the same amount of uh, same BMI level, um, Indians have less uh, muscle mass, more fat mass, and that's evident right from birth. There are studies from Pune that have looked at it in, in newborn babies compared to Caucasian babies. So, so this just, you know, going by BMI may 
you know, underestimate the uh, um, uh, impact of obesity, which ideally is defined by the total body fat content. So uh, the idea is that you have to be extremely aware of all of these things. And having said that, I would also like to mention that there are a lot of um, exciting things that are coming up for the management of obesity. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Subhashni mentioned semaglutide. Um, Laraglutide um, has been, is, is actually indicated for obesity in adults. Uh, no pediatric indication for obesity is available at this time. We don't, um, but you know, th there are, uh, I mean, semaglutide probably causes more weight loss than, than laraglutide. Terzapatide from Eli Lilly is very exciting. It causes even more weight loss than even uh, the highest dose of semaglutide. So there are a lot of exciting things coming across these dual agonists of GLP-1, GIP receptor agonists, so GLP-1 glucagon receptor agonists, et cetera. So, you know, uh, I think it's, 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 it's exciting, but having said all that, nothing works as well as bariatric surgery and probably nothing ever will work as, uh, as much as prevention does. So, um, uh, you know, it's, this, is a, this is a huge problem, but I think it can be handled. Um, children have the uh, advantage of growing. So even if you keep their weight stable, um, as they grow taller, their BMI goes down. So that's a, a wonderful uh, opportunity and a window to intervene. So um, hopefully, you know, we'll be able to make some impact eventually. And it certainly is a problem in India, for sure. Dr. Ravishankar, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Devnath, there is one question about uh, drug dosages of anesthetic agents. If Dr. Ramesh is on the line, can I ask him to ask this question directly, Dr. Ramesh? I, I can answer the question. Um, yeah. So obesity pharmacology is something that's, you know, we have, there's very little data in, in obese children and how to drug, how to dose their drugs in children. And so we extrapolate data from adults. Um, and and I, I had a couple of slides, but I ended up removing them in the interest of time. But essentially, um, you know, you, we, you have to figure out what body scale are you using? So are you going to use total body weight? Are you going uh, to use, David, which is if, the, I, if I could interrupt you, if you want to pop that slide up now, that would be fine. I, I don't have it, sorry. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so there's, you could use like total body weight, which is the actual body weight. You could use lean body mass, which is fat-free mass. Um, and you could, there's also ideal body weight. And I talked about the 50% BMI method. So when dosing drugs in, in obese children, it depends on if you're using a lipophilic drug versus a hydrophilic drug. So if you're using a lipophilic drug, because they have an increased volume of distribution, you have to base it on their total body weight. And so an example for that is when we use succinylcholine, which we rarely use in children, but you know, you'd use base it on total body weight. On the other hand, the um, non-depolarizing muscle relaxants such as uh, like all the rocuronium or vecuronium are all based on, on, on their ideal body weight because it's a hydrophilic drug. And narcotics and opioids, I, 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 again, I, they should be, you're, they're better off titrated to effect and using small doses and reducing something based on, on their like lean body mass. So that's my recommendation for using opioids. So you, so you have to figure out what their ideal body weight is or your lean body mass is and you don't want to be using their total body weight to be giving opioids. Um, and you're better off using a reduced dose because as I mentioned, they are very sensitive to narcotics. There was a question about what volatile anesthetic agent to use. Yes, desflurane has been like, and there's desflurane, sevoflurane, and isoflurane. And among the three, uh, we have actually gotten rid of desflurane in our institution because it's very bad for the environment. It has a much higher global warming potential like heating potential. And so we don't have desflurane anymore. Um, and so we use sevoflurane uh, for most of our anesthetics and we don't no notice any delay in recoveries. Doctor, uh, Yeah, sorry, Ramesh, go ahead. Can I two questions? Uh, yeah, please. I, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'm just confused because when you talk about propofol, they say the induction doses according to lead body weight and the maintenance doses according to the total body weight. So when you yeah. look at the dose of total body weight of uh, propofol, then their clearance is also is uh, prolonged. And I think, uh, uh, what is the rationale of doing a lean body weight or propofol when you put TY, you put on total body weight? 
I, I think if you're doing Tiva, the way to do it is use a target control infusion technique. But unfortunately, that's not available yeah. um, in the United States. So we depend on using like infusions based on weight. Um, and you're absolutely correct. Um, their recommendation for induction is, is using lean body mass. And for infusions, they say total body weight. Um, I just use lean body mass for both. Um, and I reduce the amount of, of propofol ba and base it off the lean body mass. Yeah, that, then there's a, for the relaxants, if you want non-depolarizing relaxants, use articurium or cis articurium, you goose according to the lean body weight, but when you want to reverse, then they say you use uh, total body weight with the uh, neostigmine. Yeah, I, I agree, it's a little confusing, um, and, and I just stick with like lean body mass or ideal body weight. Um, so I, you can, can always can give it, more, but you cannot take back what you gave, so, so that's my... Uh, I just want a simple solution for this. We are very bad in mathematics. When you come to use a calculation, I remember there are some formulas to find out like uh, Peter's formula and things like that, 0 0.2 into weight, into height. Those things, you know, we are uh, not used to those calculations. Can you give me a simple thing that really you can use it for a, a practitioner or something like that? So my, my recommendation is, is to use ideal body weight um, and, and, and or lean body mass. And the way I like calculate lean body mass is perhaps like 120% of the ideal body weight. Um, and I, I, I use that for most of my drugs. As I mentioned to you before, you can always give more, but you can't take back what you've given. So um, I just use lean body mass or ideal body weight for most of the drugs. And I completely agree with you. The Peters formula and all the allometric dosing and all that is very complicated. Um, I, and, and my simple mantra is, is titrate to effect. Use small doses uh, yeah, and, and titrate to effect. I think that's the best. I think you must titrate to the effect. Like same, you do all drugs like opioids, always titrate. When you titrate opioids, you titrate the relaxants as well. Thank you, Dr. Chad. Unless you have a robotic surgeon breathing down your neck. <laughs> that would be an exception. <laughs> then I would, And with a patient in the room. If I had, if I, in steep Trendlenburg, and of course, if I had Sugamedex, I would just go to town with the relaxant and then give Sugamedex in the end and get out. So Dr. Harita is a gynecologist, and I would like her to speak a few words about uh, adolescent um, OBGY problems and the perioperative issues. Uh, can you unmute yourself, Dr. Harita? Thank you, ma'am, for this opportunity. Um, I see a lot of adolescent girls in our uh, uh, gynecology clinic and uh, who are PCOS and are overweight and obese. And uh, they seem quite motivated. So when I talk to them about diet and exercise, uh, they tell me they hardly eat much. And uh, plus, they do exercise almost every day but then uh, with no significant weight loss. So I find it extremely challenging because I see these girls, I call them back uh, due to time constraint. I do spend some time with them, trying to counsel them regarding uh, diet, exercise and behavioral changes. Um, but then still when it doesn't uh, manifest as a change in their body weight, they're quite disappointed. So I would like Dr. Subhashni to give me some pointers towards how to um, uh, uh, motivate these girls um, for weight loss um, and uh, um, what to do when it doesn't work. <laughs> I mean, one, one of the things I have found helpful in my, in my uh, the adolescence with polycystic uh, ovaries is, is metformin. So but, metformin, oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I thought the only indication for metformin if they have an impaired glucose tolerance on their GTT. No, I have or, found uh, I found it helpful in both, like you know, because most of these kids, when I do a hemoglobin A1C, it's either they're pre-diabetic or it's at the upper limit of normal. So, in addition to sending them to the gynecologist to start them on uh, an OCP, I have found you know metformin. Uh, some kids will tolerate as much as thousand milligrams twice a day. Uh, and, you know, we start at 500 milligrams once a day and, you know, look for GI uh, side effects. But I, you know, I usually titrate it up and I found it really helpful with the weight loss. But medicalizing, medicalizing them so early, uh, long-term implications of... I, I uh, mean, for, uh, for it's, I think about it like this. We are preventing chronic complications, right? So metformin, no so medication is... How long is the metformin? What's that? How long would you continue the metformin if you start a 
probably a 14 year old on metformin how long would you continue the oral uh, i mean I, i would i would continue indefinitely so uh this is this is wrong Sorry, this is Ravi, the pediatric endocrinologist. So, so we did a, a, a survey to see uh, what proportion of uh, metformin prescriptions in uh, patients under 18 was for type 2 diabetes um, uh, or, you know, whatever, uh, glucose intolerance, whatever, less than 35%. 65% of the prescriptions, particularly in adolescent girls, was for PCOS. Um, and it, uh, like Subhashni just mentioned, it is phenomenally effective. The only thing that I have found is that metformin is not only effective in helping them with their weight, but it's also very wonderful in inducing ovulation. So if you do not give them very good sex educational counseling at that point, you can make an infertile adolescent who has had unprotected sex without consequence um you know suddenly find find themselves pregnant so that's that's been my uh, issue uh, a lot of the girls actually fee tell me uh, or have told me in the past that they internally feel so much better on metformin um so uh and 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 uh, i have not used anything less than a thousand uh, bid in 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 these girls because uh, you know um in fact in Adult women with PCOS, the dose is 850 milligrams TID, which is even more than two grams. So, um, uh, you know, sometimes I've even done that. And um, some of these girls are very, very, uh, um, you know, particular about being very compliant with metformin. But going back to your original question, when 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 the, when these girls tell you that they are exercising and that they're eating, it might be better to actually have them maintain, as Subhashni mentioned, an exercise diary, a food diary, et cetera, and to see what is exercise, what 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 they might be thinking as, you know, regular sufficient exercise may not really be that. So you need to really quantify that and make sure that it, it, it indeed is that much. Um, and, um, you know, uh, walking, I think, uh, is probably one of the best ways of doing it. Um, and um, you can help them uh, quite a bit by, you know, getting them to see where they need to improve. And for that, you need objective evidence. And, and um, uh, I, I don't know, Subhashni, if you have any particular app that you like more than anything else to track these uh -huh. things. There is an app called Kerbo. It's it's the it's the kids version of you know the Weight Watchers thing. It's free. There are some you know uh, in-app purchases, but then most of it you know for as far as tracking, it's very child friendly. And then it also gives them like the traffic light eating, like green, yellow, and red. So what foods you can eat you know uh, uh, without limit, and what foods you need to watch out for. So it it helps. It's very it's it's tailored to kids. So uh, it's it's called Kerbo, K-U-R-B-O. Uh, we have we have Dr. Uh, Anbudra, a psychiatrist. Uh, uh, all the speakers mentioned about the psychological aspects of uh, obesity, especially the adolescent. Uh, Dr. Anbudra, would you like to throw some light on that? Uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, uh, I will. Uh... Yeah, first of all, uh, it's very nice listening to all this and it's great what you're doing, uh, you know, week after week. Uh, so, uh, you know, in a very, uh, what should I call, in a nutshell, I will not only say something about psychiatry, but more about uh, community medicine. So there, I think all this can be incorporated and we can look at it from a three-level approach, like primary prevention, even primordial prevention, that is, in Hindi, they say, you know, na baas, na bajegi so you take off even the risk factor. See, when there is a risk factor, you have to practice a lifestyle thing. But if the, you remove the risk factor itself, so primary prevention, early detection and this thing. And thirdly will come all your rehabilitative surgeries and all those extra other things that we do. So in this, I think we have to have a more... Uh, like uh, someone was mentioning, it's not a village that takes a child to, I mean, it's not only a village that is needed to bring up a child, but a whole country. I would say a whole world, because everywhere we go today, we travel all over the place, not just all over the country, but even all over the world, globe. So everywhere we need to, so the one thing that I think we have, everybody was saying, you know, pediatric obesity is something we are not uh, uh, paying so much attention, and it goes to the, uh, the, the, tertiary stage where you have to do surgery and 
um, medication and a lot of heavy duty rehab you have to do physio and all that uh, and which leads to a lot of restriction of lifestyle a lot of uh, psychological consequences obviously so it's a two way process actually obesity is in the middle so sometimes something causes obesity some psychological and social things cause obesity on the other hand this obesity further leads to so it's a vicious cycle so uh, so better that we don't get into that thing at all and how we try to of course you slip then yes the next level uh, care is available so here we need that integrated care and it starts with very uh, like he said prevention ounces of prevention so that doesn't even require experts like us to be there so even a health worker or a community worker or a volunteer can share many standard things you know so if we start from there and we uh, have a integrated package like that where you have a primary health center community active community programs where uh, you know uh, the uh, the uh, from starting from the marriage and uh, family value education uh the uh, uh the uh, when you provide uh, maternal care and the child services so it starts from there so that way you can catch them young so roughly this is what i would say so I have a three pronged approach that is primary prevention secondary and tertiary and uh, uh, in all this have a overall community approach that means everybody is covered at whatever level so we don't wait till they slip into the second stage or the third stage as much as possible we catch them young catch them early inculcate all the habits alter school uh, you know canteens what they provide uh, you know all those kind of things uh, so this requires a huge overhaul so that is what so only one small question i have everybody uh, of course body mass index but i also was uh, a long time back i read about uh, hip waist ratio so would that also help in uh, uh, with uh, kids or adolescents so parvati would you like take that yeah yeah sure yes a waist basically waist circumference and a waist to hip ratio is uh, definitely useful especially in assessing the uh, chance for developing a metabolic syndrome right now actually we are doing a school based study which is actually stopped now because of the covid situation and we have found that uh, in uh, those children with a waist circumference more than 70th centile and the elevated waist hip ratio the uh, metabolic complications have be- have been found to be very high so it's definitely it's very important and also i would like to make one more point which i missed out basically doing a thyroid function in obesity that could most of the time uh, we get uh, another referral is for increased tsh in an obese child. so we should understand that this message is basically for pediatricians in this group and elevated tsh there is a, a possibility of a subclinical hypothyroidism with a mild elevation in tsh in the range of 5 to 10 with a normal free t4 or total t4 is very common in obesity that is basically because of the uh, peripheral thyroid resistance and the increased leptin that is increasing the trh and increasing the tsh so that is not something which requires a treatment many of the children come to us uh, they are already put on thyroxine which is unnecessary definitely they need an evaluation you need to look at the family history of hypothyroidism you need to look at the thyroid antibodies and keep the children under follow up but if the tsh is less than 10 there is no need for treatment once the child achieves a weight loss the tsh naturally comes down to normal so that is one point i want to make out uh, uh, put up and uh, dr harita was mentioning about the uh, uh, dietary history so uh, i would say probably less than 10% of families would tell you that there's a high calorie diet in the indian scenario so uh, i i don't think you can uh, take it uh, completely we need to make a dietary chart a 24 hour dietary we call one by one and uh, get to the bottom uh, because uh, when we when, whenever we take a detailed dietary history we find that we uh definitely there is a high calorie diet and sedentary habits in the children yeah and one of the things that I, i would like to say is you know there's this concept of something called blt it's not ba- bacon lettuce tomato sandwich it's it's bites licks and tastes so when i tell my patients to keep a food diary it means literally everything that goes in their mouth you take a bite of something you lick something or you taste sambar while you're cooking yes it is food so every single piece of you know water food whatever goes in your mouth needs to be written down and then the time and we go even further and say how were you feeling were you feeling hungry were you feeling thirsty were you feeling sad because comfort eating is is a big factor so we ask them to log all of these things uh in our program uh 
Dr. Sripathi, any uh, inputs on uh, this? I mean, we, we've, uh, we've covered uh, obesity very sure. extensively, but uh, most of the time you and I will be faced with uh, children coming for something else where we, uh, we just don't have the time or opportunity to do any of these things except uh, rule out, uh, you know, metabolic syndrome or uh, uh, associated congenital um, uh, uh, anomalies or something. So uh, a word to uh, uh, surgeons who are occasional pediatric surgeons or uh, those who are just starting out in their uh, pediatric surgery career, uh, your advice about handling obese children. I think we see obesity in the context of what Dr. Subhashini and Dr. Devnath said. We see them from the point of view of uh, most parents, especially given the preponderance or the uh, uh, the fondness that Indians have for boys. They're very worried about the small size of the genitalia in their adolescents who are absolutely, uh, you know, horribly obese. And they want us to do something. They want us to do some surgery in order to improve that. And that is how we bring them to attention. One of the problems that I have is uh, to have uh, pediatricians who are specifically interested or dedicated to manage obese children. And uh, sometimes in a very busy OPD practice, sometimes they tend to get neglected. So the service that sort of that uh, Dr. Subhashini is talking about, the comprehensive approach that she's talking about is something that should be an integral part of every hospital, uh, in my opinion, uh, in India, which is taking care of children. And that is what we should be aiming at. And uh, once we get on to that, thereafter trying to impress on the government to bring about social changes by large scale meetings in schools, talking with parents, parents are quite aware of this. Uh, one thing that COVID has done is they've become much more aware of uh, how obnoxious sometimes their children's eating and sleeping habits are. So I think, you know, uh, this is sort of becoming a big issue and I'm sure we are at a stage where the parents are very sensitive to all this. And once you bring them on board with this, especially in a family in India where you have the grandparents deciding what the grandchildren will eat and trying to control the family, it's important to tell the grandparents also where they, you know, where they buzz off and they don't interfere with the bringing up of the children. So a lot of this thing has to be done at many levels. And the first thing I think is to bring awareness of this, which I think Dr. Subhashini brought out so beautifully. The other issues with regard to pertaining to anesthesia and how to go on to bariatric surgery, Dr. Devnath dealt with in great detail. And all in all, it's a brilliant meeting. And Dr. Subhashini, I think you should have a, a parent-friendly sort of you know, discussion, uh, part of your presentation, which, can, which will resonate yeah. with parents. And this mm -hmm. is something that we can take to all groups and you know, bring awareness to people. For instance, this Facebook recording is something that I will recommend a lot of our uh, uh, parents to have a look at. Because one of the things that often parents say, doctor, it's very easy for you to say, you know, put these children on a diet. They're getting very angry with us. And there's a huge amount of anger and they fight and, uh, you know, it creates a lot of problems at home. And this is where I think, you know, the psychologist, the psychiatrist comes in. But my problem is, again, the pediatricians in our hospital are so busy, very few of them have time for this. And uh, I mean, the endocrinologists, I know there are two or three endocrinologists in the group between our uh, dealing with, uh, you know, DSDs and dealing with obesity, I think DSDs get preference, uh, you know, as associated with so many other things. So I think, you know, it needs a comprehensive uh, team to look at it. Dr. Subhashini, great work. Uh, Dr. Devnath is uh, sort of locked out, uh, but, uh, you know, brilliant presentation. I wish we had more time to discuss this. And Vidya, it's a great effort to bring uh, this particular topic for discussion absolutely relevant in this day and age. Thank you very much, Vidya. Uh, thank you. Vidya, can I just add one thing, one, one last thing? Sure. I've, I've, I've heard a lot of people talk about the genitalia of the fat. Uh, Dr. Vidya, I needed to just add uh, two things. The voice is breaking up, Anbo. You need to go to another part of your room. Hello. Yeah, yeah better. One last thing uh, that uh, uh, we look at a, a group approach, not just group uh, health education, but group. And two, uh, as uh, Doctor said, uh, you know we have to look at uh, uh, psychological processes, and there are a lot of uh, uh, so that so we should uh, in an interview because so that the the whatever we gain through the surgery is maintained.
obtained zero i think dr anku there are some problems uh, with your audio uh, uh, and so it's an integrated thing where uh, dr ravi shankar yeah no i was going to say that dr shripati you'll you'll appreciate it hello so, that most uh, uh, you know we've been talking about the genitalia and these fat uh, male adolescents it's not that they are not properly formed it's more of a buried penis they have too much of suprapubic exactly. fat completely buries this these genitalia so i don't want anybody going away with the idea that somehow obesity in adolescent males causes a um you know some sort of deformed uh, um sexual development so absolutely not and by the same token many of the girls who um are thought to have thylarchy actually just have fat so um we have used ultrasound many times to make sure that um you know to distinguish between fat and compressed breast tissue uh, um in terms of thylarchy so um it's 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 really kind of hard uh, many of them have advanced um i mean premature adrenarchy so yes they have pubic hair developing at a much earlier age but true central precocious puberty may not be as uh, uh common as uh, people think it is um in 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 some instances so i just wanted to make those two points but thank absolutely. you so much absolutely hello um a wonderful uh, thing uh, you know uh, discussion it affects everything and like dr anbu said you know psychiatric problems cause obesity obesity causes psychiatric problems so you know you know that that cycle has to be broken somewhere so uh thank you everyone for joining thanks subhashree for suggesting this topic i know you told me long ago but uh, we finally got to it uh, um thank you dr shripati for uh, joining in and staying for this long and being so patient and what is apparently became a absolutely non surgical <laughs> discussion uh, thanks to uh, dr parvati dr harika and of course my friend uh, ravi uh, radha krishna would you like to say something before we sign off amazing talks and uh, very great moderation by dr shripati and i really enjoyed uh, listening to all this and i mean i think it's one of the very high quality marvelous medicine sessions i think it's time we all take notice of uh, obesity in children in india which we take it very easy all these days and thanks everyone thanks for being there uh thank you everybody we'll meet again next week with another uh, edition of marvelous medicine uh good night and uh, take care and stay safe